Hello again. Welcome back to the Global Agriculture Innovation Forum. I'm Gerald Shively, Associate Dean and Director of International Programs in the College of Agriculture at Purdue, your host for the forum. As always, I'm thrilled to be able to introduce the forum. On behalf of the organizing committee, our advisory group, and everyone contributing to this effort, I'd like to welcome you, and I'd like to thank USDA, especially the Foreign Agricultural Service, for its continued support of these events. If you are just joining us, this is the third special topic session of the forum, organized under the theme, Farms and Farmers of the Future. In case you are unable to join us for previous sessions, those recorded presentations are now archived and available on the forum website and linked via the Socio app. The year-long series of events on the theme of agricultural innovation is designed to explore the frontier of innovations with a few to feeding the world sustainably. The focus for this session is to explore the challenges of enabling farmers everywhere with transformational technologies. We have a great group of thought-provoking presentations, beginning with our moderators, Dr. Leslie Goh, who joins us from the World Bank, where she is Senior Technology Advisor. Please enjoy the program and please stay for the live question and answer period that will follow the presentations. Thank you, Professor Shifley, for the kind introduction and to Purdue University for the honor to moderate this panel of distinguished speakers. I work closely with governments, policymakers, and regulators to leverage digital solutions to address the sustainable development goals in emerging markets at the intersection of technology and policy framework. I recently worked on a chapter contribution for the Brookings Institute book project called Breakthrough Technologies for the Sustainable Development Goals. My chapter contribution is about the agricultural sector, which is an integral part of the economic activities and 26% of employment globally. 700 million of farmers live below the poverty line. Therefore, focusing on managing risk and increasing outcome for the smallholder farmers could have a significant impact to poverty reduction. I would like to call your attention to a new book launch by the World Bank on March 17, 2021. What's Cooking? The Digital Transformation of the Agricultural System, taking a farm-centric approach to address the risk for farmers. The report proposes a roadmap through which data and digital technologies can lead to efficient, equitable, and environmental sustainable food systems. The report put forward the role of the public sector to maximize the impacts and the potential of leveraging digital technologies to transform the agri-food system and focuses on the opportunities offered to farmers. If you missed the event on the launching of the report on March 17, the recording is available. This dynamic event brought together global food tech innovators and thought leaders from private and public sector to discuss the transformational potential of digital technology in agriculture to deliver healthier people, healthier planet, and healthy economies. Here is a short video with the highlights of the report. Our global agri-food system sustains the world's ever-growing population, creates millions of jobs, and is critical in achieving the sustainable development goals. But the global agri-food system is not fit for purpose and stresses the environment by generating up to 29% of greenhouse gases. And while there is an overabundance of food, 820 million people are undernourished worldwide. This is due to the global agri-food system being held back, partly by transaction costs and information asymmetries, which prevent profitable transactions. The agri-food system is complex and it takes dozens of stakeholders and transactions to bring food from farmers to consumers. Transaction costs are incurred by business partners to find each other, determine sales conditions such as volumes, quality, and negotiating prices, and return policies. 
Because of information asymmetries, which occur when one stakeholder has more or better information than another, traders and consumers cannot tell whether a product is high quality or meets their environmental or social standards. This costs the farmer profits, drives them to choose quantity over quality, often at the expense of the environment, and limits consumers' product choices. But through digital technologies and mass access to data, the world's agri-food system can overcome these obstacles and deliver healthy people, a healthy planet, and healthy economies. The World Bank is a trusted partner in helping countries' agri-food systems navigate the digital revolution. Our new report provides insights into the potential of leveraging digital technologies to transform the agri-food system. Digital agriculture can create societal gains with the three E's, economic efficiency. Through farmers being able to access multiple markets and lower costs through improved price discovery, buyer selling matching, improved traceability and quality control. Equity, through the inclusion of smallholder farms and marginalized populations. And environmental sustainability through reducing food waste, better resource management, and rewarding environmentally friendly practices. Creation of and access to data allows new ways to evaluate small-scale farmers and agribusinesses' creditworthiness, improve their access to rural finance, and allows the design of affordable insurance products. Digital technologies also allow efficient government policy designs, policy implementation, and environmental outcomes monitoring. These benefits are great, but digital agriculture also has risks, like a digital divide. Many people still can't access technology or sufficient internet and don't know how to use it. The second risk is data governance. Farmers' business and personal information can be exposed, tempting misuse. Lastly, there's the risk of limited competition. There are concerns that digital markets will increase market power and filter profits to a few digital technology providers. How do we ensure the agri-food system benefits from digital technology? First, governments need to increase access to digital and physical infrastructure for data and technology use throughout the food system. Second, policies need to support innovative ecosystems for digital agriculture through open data sets, digital platforms, digital entrepreneurship, digital payment systems, and digital skills. Equally critical is ensuring a competitive environment for digital services providers. We also need policies that protect data use and sharing against misuse. And make sure the agriculture policies maximize digital agriculture's potential for environmental sustainability. Through the digital transformation and with the right policies, the food system can deliver healthy people a healthy planet, and healthy economies. For the next segment, we will have four distinguished agriculture experts to share their experience. Please post your questions in the chat window here, and we will invite them to answer your questions in the Q&A segment. I would like to start our panel discussion with our first speakers, Dr. David Bergenson. He is the Chief Science Officer at AWARE. In his role, he accelerates innovation and access to premium weather data from over 1.9 million virtual weather stations to generate the agriculture insights for farmers, agribusiness, agri-food, and policymakers globally. He will share with us apps and technologies that improve production efficiency. Over to you, David. Apps and technologies that improve production efficiency for farmers. My name is David Bergvinson. I'm Chief Science Officer at AWARE. And in this session, we're gonna explore the, the world of apps and how important they are for modern farming systems. So our presentation is gonna focus on why apps are important today, what are the top apps and how they help farmers, lessons learned about the implementation of these applications and the future of apps to empower farmers. As we were doing this work, there were some high level observations that uh, came to mind. One is that they're really doing with 
two very different types of farmers, advanced economies where commercial farms are extremely large and farmers are very sophisticated and have access to a wide range of tools. And then there's the farmers in emerging markets, often smallholder farmers working in rain-fed production environments that have very limited access to even basic information such as weather, market pricing, um, and, and specific agronomic recommendations to empower um, them to increase their productivity. So we're going to explore you know, these two different worlds and in the future of, of apps. So let's get started. So why are apps important today is that they allow us to address this challenge that's been in agriculture for a long time, that agriculture is a data intensive enterprise, and yet most farmers around the world are operating in a data poor environment. And so apps offer farmers access then to localized recommendations uh, that help them improve farm operations, reduce their risk, and to enhance uh, their ability to manage natural resources, uh, ultimately increasing their profits and even freeing up time uh, for other activities in their family. So uh, these are some of the benefits we see of apps. Uh, it's interesting to note that way back in 2010 that apps uh, was voted the most uh, popular word of the year. And, and so it continues to be in our vernacular today even more so. So uh, what are the top apps and how are they helping farmers? Um, when we started this work, we had a look at Google, Glo uh, Google Play Store to see you know, what were the most popular apps. And it was interesting that it was gaming apps that were uh, doing virtual farming were actually the most popular apps on Google. Uh, and it wasn't really uh, the, the most popular app that we saw uh, related to uh, fertilizer applications for, for farmers. The, uh, when, when we went to YouTube to see what farmers were looking for, what people were looking for around farm apps, we found that um, the most popular apps were focused on helping farmers with diagnosing pests and diseases in the field uh, and also helping farmers connect directly to consumers. So we'll explore those in a little more detail. Um, some of our other observations were that the most popular apps tended to offer location-specific and timely recommendations to farmers, uh, that they had uh, really went through a, a human-centered design process to understand how farmers interact with technology and what drives adoption, that uh, they considered local production and uh, market constraints in their design quite often, and that uh, they often used artificial intelligence to uh, distill complex data and crop production uh, systems in order to make simple recommendations. And when they were able to achieve this, they enjoyed broad adoption by, by a, a range of farmers. Um, so, so one of the examples that, that did apply that last point was Plantix. Now, back in 2016, I had the privilege of working with this group in India. And uh, basically, they went around on a motorcycle collecting images of crop damage uh, pest and disease for different crops uh, in smallholder farmer fields and use this to develop a database on which they did machine learning to do image recognition of a wide range of pests and diseases. Uh, this application now enjoys uh, widespread adoption by farmers, especially in India. And you can see by the number of YouTube views uh, a year and a half ago, uh, around 420,000, it's, it's a very popular app uh, and very exciting as we apply modern science, data science, to serve smallholder farmers. A similar uh, commercial offering is Farm Vision AI. Uh, this one's really focusing on uh, horticulture and greenhouse environments, but again, using the phone to diagnose uh, pests and diseases and, and, the, and giving a recommendation for how a farmer can manage those effectively and safely. Now, uh, the number of views on YouTube is only 120 for this particular uh, commercial offering. So again, it's a very focused commercial market in advanced economies, but it also shows the scale and need uh, for these apps in emerging markets by smallholder farmers. Um, so when we look at how organizations are ranking uh, the top apps, so here is an example uh, from the United States with, from the Farm Bureau Financial Services. They, they ranked eight apps, uh, not all of which were agriculture, some were also uh, focused on uh, uh, you know, cattle, and 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 so uh, it was interesting though that only the Yara Check It really had an international audience when we started to unpack each of those uh, offerings. Uh, we also had a look at 
uh, how crop life uh, ranked the best agriculture apps for 2021. Uh, that came out this month and they looked at 26 and featured 26 uh, different apps that they felt were really prominent and delivered value to farmers. It was interesting that none of those actually overlapped with the previous list that I just showed you. Um, but again, here too, we noticed that these apps are largely focused on uh, commercial farmers in, in advanced economies of the United States and Europe. Uh, there were a couple that served uh, farmers internationally, uh, one of which is the Crop Nutrient Advisor shown here. But again, it is also doing uh, analytics using the smartphone to load up images that diagnose a micronutrient or nutrient deficiency that, for a specific crop that gives a recommendation back to the farmer. So um, a, a lot of exciting evolution taking place in the world of apps. And increasingly, organizations are finding out better how to serve the needs of farmers through these services. Our own journey uh, at AWARE has uh, resulted in partnerships in emerging markets like Kenya to understand how we scale up weather-based services to smallholder farmers. And one project that we had uh, supported by uh, Mercy Corps, an NGO with a broad network of connections to both farmers and the marketplace, as well as the Kenyan Agricultural Research and Livestock Organization and Safaricom, uh, who provided their DigiFarm platform to deliver SMS messages to smallholder farmers for specific crops based on when they planted the crop and the weather conditions. And farmers found that this service was useful for them in timing the planting of their crop. So 73% responded favorably to that. They also uh, found that they used better crop management practices as a result of this targeted and simple service. It ultimately resulted in half of them saying they saw productivity increase, with only 10% saying that the service was not effective or useful for them. And clearly, we need to go back and find out why that was the case as we learn and improve on the delivery of these services. What we did learn, though, that these services need to be tailored to the needs and aspirations of farmers and, and taking into account the context in which these farmers are operating. Critically important. One of those is the challenges farmers are facing with rainfall variability due to climate change. And so the demand for climate advisory services by these farmers is extremely high and a service that's desperately needed um, really around the world, but especially for emerging markets. Uh, one other lesson we learned as we engaged with scientists uh, across organizations was that we need to keep our science sound, but also simple. And, and this is really important as we craft messages to farmers so that they're uh, clear, concise and actionable. Very important. Uh, and to that end, understanding what are the goals of farmers and making sure that our apps are serving and empowering them to achieve those goals, most of which are around managing risk and increasing their income. To, to do this, we need to have a human-centered design that considers things like gender, language, culture, how they interact with technology, and connectivity to, to networks that allow them to access information. The use of metrics is really important as we develop apps, so capturing baseline and then capturing performance metrics. Clearly, digital is an ideal medium for capturing metrics, but we need to integrate that into the design of the service so that we can evolve the service over time to make sure it's serving the needs of farmers. And finally, uh, what we see is that to scale these solutions, we really need effective and diverse partnerships, as we found in Kenya. I uh, can't say enough about this. The role of public-private partnerships is critically important for translating great science and making sure it reaches the hands and fields of farmers. So when we look at the future of apps, uh, on the left, we see the evolution of mobile apps more broadly, uh, going from really a, a mobile website uh, where it's a, you know, a click-based interaction with the user through to today where we're having a wide range of microservices or apps that are based on artificial intelligence, uh, uh, capturing data from the consumer in order to tailoring this service based on what the consumer is looking for at that time and what's available to them so that they can act on that. So clearly artificial intelligence is gonna be playing an increasingly important role as we develop apps for farmers around the world. But with this comes the need for increased data security and governance. Uh, last thing we wanna do is betray the trust of farmers uh, with these new apps. So it's really incumbent on us to be very responsible in how data is managed um, and, and, and curated. 
We see the evolution of uh, more end-to-end -end services that bring together these micro apps and connect them so that farmers' operations are seamlessly integrated. Likewise, commodity value chains are compressed so that more value is delivered to the farmer in the form of enhanced income and more value is delivered to the consumer in the form of lower prices, safer and more nutritious food. We also see apps helping in the tracking of environmental, social and governance metrics. Increasingly, supermarkets are being asked by their consumers, how are you responsibly sourcing this food? And that's feeding back to the farmer. So apps can actually help farmers capture this information that then will allow them to access premium markets to increase their profitability. We're also seeing apps help farmers reduce their capital costs by contracting tractor services, for example, so that a farmer does not need to make that large capital outlay. Uh, Hello Tractor was one of the early examples of this, but we see a proliferation of these kinds of apps now around the world in helping farmers with, with mechanical logistics. We also see the integration of financial services critically important in modern applications. And, and this is not just mobile money, it's accessing credit based on uh, profiling of farmers with mobile services and also being able to access weather indexed insurance based on their past history of production, the environment in which they're operating and the crops that they're cultivating. We also see this is an exciting tool to bring youth to agriculture. Youth will see the modernization of agriculture via in part applications like what we've just discussed and to see agriculture then not only as a profitable business but one that's also attractive and one that they can feel good about in producing nutritious food for their communities. So in, in some apps are the modern implement that will position farmers for success and ensure sustainable uh, nutrition for consumers globally. I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear about technologies that increase product value from Dr. Klein Ileleji is a professor and extension engineer at agricultural and biological engineering at Purdue University. His research focuses in the areas of grain and crop post harvest technology powder technology and biomass feedstock systems engineering. And he's also the co-founder and CEO of a startup that is incubated at Purdue Foundry. Kudos to that startup. Over to you, Klein. Hello there. I am Klein Illology, a professor and extension engineer of agriculture and biological engineering at Purdue University. Today, I'll be talking about technologies that increase product value. And what I'm talking about is technologies that transform a fresh product like an apple to, for example, a dry product like an apple chip. There are various ways by which you can transform a fresh product to a value added product to increase income for the small grower. However, I'll argue that drying is one of the lowest cost means of doing so for the vast amount of small growers in the humid tropics. The first thing we need to address is the pain of the small grower. Globally, about $1.3 trillion of food is lost either due to post-harvest losses or food wastage. And a lot of this, uh, the, most of the post-harvest losses occur with small growers in developing countries. If you look at growers that produce uh, foods in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, which constitute about over a billion, a lot of them still practice drying using hygienic drying practices, as you can see on the screen. So what is value addition by sun drying? It's the, one of the oldest forms of food preservation known to humans. Once the product is dried and stored hematically, the product shelf life is automatically extended. The unfortunate thing about drying is that because of primitive drying practices, and most of them being unhygienic, most of that product cannot go to premium markets. So farmers essentially cannot earn 
a good income from the dry products they produce. The technologies available are still at prototyping stage or do-it-yourself units. And that's one of the reasons why we still have in primitive means of drying being used today. Uh, Professor Bradford in his paper does talk about the dry food chain. And the dry food chain essentially is once the product is dry, it requires no more energy to keep it in storage, unlike the cold chain, which you require energy to keep it still in storage. So I will argue that solar drying technologies are also climate smart. It supports sustainable agriculture, it's renewable, it's zero carbon emissions, and can be delivered at scale if designed well. It also fights food and nutrition security, what we call the silent hunger, delivering much needed micronutrients. It extends shelf life in foods, and it, maintain, it maintains nutrients for use in various forms. The Lancet, Eat, uh, the Eat Lancet Commission's report states that food is the strongest lever to optimize human health and environmental sustainability on Earth. And I'll argue that solo drying can help meet that need. Like I said, solo drying is still practiced in most parts of the world by small growers in its primitive form, essentially drop on the ground or the, the product laid bare on the ground to dry. And with that comes all forms of contamination from livestock, dust, and humans. Well, there have been a lot of solar dryers designed in the past. In fact, when I did a Google search on solar drying, I got 30.5 million heats in 0.55 seconds. So it's a well-researched area. A lot of good dries are out there. But the question is, why are these not on the market? One of the primary reasons is that most of these designs are designs to solve solution of drying rather than a business strategy of getting fresh products or foods into value-added products that can be sold and earn an income for the farmer. So we need to move from a mindset of solving the solution of spoilage to a business strategy of how do we add value to products that can earn income and also be nutritious to health for the small grower. Our product design strategy needs to meet farmer's needs. They need to be simple and affordable. They need to take advantage of economics of scale in manufacturing and they must have a commercial potential, especially using various business models. I call my product design attributes slick. Simple, light and mobile, intuitive and innovative, compact, and it has to be a keeper. When you have it, you don't want to let it go. So let's look at one product that meets some of these attributes. But before I go there, I'd like to talk about two pathways that a product with a slick attribute will be able to meet, deliver. When you look at the dry food chain, the question comes, becomes, how do you deliver value-added products at scale using the dry food chain? One means is harvesting the fresh products, for example, a bunch of apples, moving them towards the city where they are processed in a factory. The challenge with that in developing countries is you have bad roads, you have issues with checkpoints all the way during the transport. It's typically in a humid climate, humid temperate, um, tropical climate, so it's very humid, so all hot, and so the product can easily go bad. And where you have all these logistical challenges, you might lose 50% of your fresh products before it even gets to the factory gate. The other option will be getting the farmer involved in the process. And what I mean by that, involved in processing, where you give them a technology where they can use to process uh, your fresh product into a dry product 
and then you move that dried product to the factory gate closer to the CD weights package. Well, for the farmer or a farmer, a group of farmers who go into a co-op, you're going to enable them to earn an income by getting them involved in that business. They definitely will grow. You ensure food security and empowerment. For the producer, you're saving on logistics costs and risks from spoilage. Quality losses, risks are down, and you're not transporting water. It's a lighter product. Typically, a lot of fruits and veggies are about 80% water, and essentially, you, you're looking at 80% weight reduction in your product. So let's look at one product that meets some of these attributes. It's not the only product in the world, but it's one product developed in my lab at Purdue. And that is the dehydrate. It's a modular drying system that is designed to dry various products, especially in this case, I'm looking at fresh fruits and veggies, granular products like seeds, beans, cocoa beans, coffee, and the like. The product is designed with characteristics that it's easily dismantled. It can be put together and packaged and transported long distances, so distribution is easy. And once the end user gets it, it's easily assembled in a minute. It also a product that can be used in the household with a few units, in businesses with a number of units. There are a number of business plans that you can use with a product. It's designing products with these types of attributes, thinking of the business in mind, where the farmer can use it, either as for household or use it as a business is what I'm talking about. That these will be technologies that will be transformational to the farmer. So we're looking at what I call imagining the women on this picture drying tomatoes just on the background to drying with the dehydrate, which is more hygienic. It opens them economic opportunity for, for them being able to sell their product to better markets with extended shelf life and better quality. I just want to say that I brought the product here into the studio today. It's a product that is portable. It can be easily um, used by the young and the old because it's light, less than five pounds. And it can be used by various crops. And it's thinking of a product design mode, thinking of a product that goes to be used to be produced in large scale, distributed in large scale, that we need to think about designing. I'd like to end here by saying dried foods are as good as fresh foods. Thank you. Well, please continue to post your questions in the Q&A window. Coming up next is a speaker whose papers I've read since 2018, and I'm delighted to virtually meet him here. Mr. Larry Cooley is the President Emeritus and Senior Advisor of Management Systems International. For more than four decades, Larry has been a thought leader, author, and lecturer on a variety of, of development management issues. He's gonna share with us key issues in scaling transformational innovations in agriculture. Let's hear it from him. Thanks very much for inviting me and to Jerry and to Purdue for the chance to speak about scaling, clearly one of my favorite subjects. The topic today for me is how come we don't do better? If you want to look for the real bottom line, I'm gonna to try to dig underneath a little bit what's I think on balance a relatively disappointing track record where I and an increasingly large number of people believe better is possible. Let me start with a couple of sobering statistics. The first is that overall, about one in 20 well-validated innovations ever reach scale. Think about it the other way around, that means 19 out of 20 don't. And for those that do reach scale, we're talking about an average of about 15 years from inception to scale. Too slow, too few for the challenges that face us, particularly in the sustainable development goals 
and the setbacks that we faced against the pandemic of, of late. So let's figure out why. How come when industrial agriculture has been such a powerhouse of innovation, pro-poor agriculture has done so poorly in terms of trying to catch up? How come those track records are as poor as I just mentioned? I think if you had to go for two reasons, they'd be these two. The first is that we've been preoccupied with technological innovation and it's distracted us from some of the many other challenging things that stand in the way of those innovations ever reaching scale. And the second thing is I think there's been a suspicion, perhaps in some cases with a little bit of merit, but a suspicion that governments and the private sector have had about each other in this arena. Uh, if you look at underneath that a little bit, people talk very almost glowingly about the relationship between public and private and public-private partnership. But when it comes right down to that, at the transactional level, we've shown a real reluctance, what some people call moral hazard in trying to deal with this. And I think we can do much better. So I'm gonna try to share in the next few minutes some specific cases and examples where I think people have done better in some of the lessons that have been learned along the way. Let's start with the issue of incentives. In a normal world, businesses have got all kinds of incentives to try to sell to as many people as possible. Let's call that the addressable market. And governments for their part have incentives to try to reach as much of the relevant population as they can. That's what governments do. So you could say that governments and businesses have scale built into their DNA. But when you go to a different world, a world where there are donors and implementing partners and beneficiaries and, and act, other actors in the picture, it gets much more complicated. The incentives get more complicated and so do the transactions. And one of the consequences of that is that the normal compulsion to scale get sometimes distracted or diluted in what we might call a project-based world, where the focus is on direct beneficiaries, immediate effects, and not nearly as much on systemic exchange and on long-term benefits and sustainability. Can that be reversed or redirected? I think so, and I think some of the cases that I'm gonna mention are good examples of that. So how would it look if we were doing it the other way? Well, first of all, we'd be working backwards from a concrete vision of sustainable delivery at scale. And we'd be asking ourselves in that world, who would be delivering what to whom, at what price, under what set of circumstances, and how do we get from where we are now to where we would have to be for that to be the case? And almost without exception, that will probably not be a donor-driven solution. That's gonna be something that's either governments, businesses, or some combination of the two. In that world, agriculture is a business, not a social sector. Philanthropy and governments are no substitute for, sorry, philanthropy is no substitute for governments and for markets. Projects still have a role to play, but their role is as interventions, time-bounded interventions that are intended to somehow stimulate, facilitate, or otherwise catalyze permanent changes. The focus is not on the project. The focus is not on the research. The focus is what has to change in the system and how that intervention is helping to propel it. Let's look at time frame a little bit in that context. There's a model that I use for many, many years that talks about scaling in terms of three very distinct phases. It starts with the issue of effectiveness. This is what those of us in the research side usually call proof of concept. And it's when we're developing prototypes and examples and models. It then goes on to a second phase where we're going beyond effectiveness and looking for efficiency. Well, what's going on there? We're trying to bring down costs. We're trying to simplify interventions. We're trying to find ways to take advantage of economies of scale. And then finally, and only then, do we proceed on to the issue of expansion. Namely, how do we reach large numbers of people and do so in a permanent sort of a way? That was my operative model. It's many people's operative model, but after two decades of working at this, I'm now convinced that's the wrong model. And really in order for that process to work, that process of scaling, the concept of scale and the dynamics of scale have to be in your head right at the beginning 
of that process. By the beginning, I mean before you know that this intervention is even going to be effective. That's a little bit counterintuitive because it's a little bit like having your foot on the accelerator and on the brake at the same time. But in my experience, if you don't do it that way, what happens is you design things that are either too expensive, too complicated, or too divorced from the underlying system to meet the needs that they're gonna to have to meet. That means even for those of us who are on the research side, our research is not simply can we make something that works or how do we make it work as well as possible, but how do we make it work in a way that's compatible with and it's already beginning the process of transition into those permanent systems, whether they be markets, governments, or a combination of the two. Okay, well, let's look at some examples where that may have happened. In, when I started this process of searching for agricultural examples, particularly pro-poor agricultural examples a few years ago, I was struck by the shortage of well-documented cases. Partially in response to that, USAID commissioned the firm I used to run, Management Systems International, to do five in-depth cases. They're the ones on the left-hand side of your slide hybrid maize in Zambia, irrigated rice in Senegal, two-wheeled tractors in Bangladesh, pigs bags in Kenya, very familiar to those of you at Purdue, and Corolla chickens in Uganda. Each one of these I think makes a fascinating and really revealing case about what it takes to truly take something to scale and what some of the obstacles expected and unexpectable along the way. Then after the conference that took place in Purdue in 2018, which personally I thought was an absolutely seminal event, it's the first time on pro-poor agriculture, I really felt the right people were gathered in the right place around the right issues to talk about scaling pro-poor solutions. And in the aftermath of that, Purdue and the African Development Bank asked Julie Howard and myself to write a source book on scaling agriculture which we did with great enthusiasm and with great pride. Uh, three of the cases that I thought shown through on that one illustrate a, another dynamic about scaling. One is the experience of One Acre Fund, another is Babangona, a third is Hello Tractor. There, there are others, but there's not a large number of others. In each case, again, you start to see not just how the technological innovation or the, the agronomic innovation but the business sector innovations and the policy innovations all converge to make these changes really operative. Two other cases I think are very instructive. One is the case of heat tolerant maize. The second very nicely documented case of orange flesh sweet potatoes on biofortification. Uh, you, we could add to this list, but I would say this is a good starter set of cases that really have a lot to tell us about scaling in agriculture. I'm going to try to bring some of that together in the form of seven lessons that I think can be taken away from that experience about trying to bring scaling to the fore as both a mindset and as a set of operational principles that can take us through the scaling pathways where commercial actors are involved. The first, and this may be a little bit counterintuitive, is that I now believe there's no such thing as a purely commercial pathway to scale. The government's fingerprints are all over everything in agriculture, whether you're in a developed or a developing country. Subsidies, regulations, procedures, all of these things weigh very heavily on our success or lack thereof in scaling particular innovations. And that means that there's an enormous premium on governments and businesses, and not just the private sector in general, but individual businesses learning to work together more effectively, more convincingly, and more, comp and more compellingly. Second, the most vexing bottlenecks for scaling pro-poor agricultural innovations, in my experience, are usually non-technological. That doesn't mean the agronomics aren't important. It just means they're not enough. And so when you start looking at what the margin of difference was in the things that scaled and the things that didn't, you see a whole series of political and I would say particularly business innovations that were in that chain and that made all the difference in the world. It may not have been the best technological solution, but it was good enough and had a lot of these other things built in along the way. Third, 
I think that partnerships in the middle of the value chain are particularly important. I'm thinking about things like equipment leasing or product aggregation or insurance, things that are neither the growing of the crops nor the ultimate marketing, where we've talked a lot about partnerships. But these partnerships in the middle, whether they're private-private or public-private, to me have plays an outsized role in the things that have gone to scale. If you look back at the cases that I mentioned previously, you'll find extraordinarily interesting examples of this in each and every one of them. Fourth, poor farmers' time horizons tend to be extremely short, and they also place a much higher priority on minimizing risk than on maximizing reward. And if you think about it, that means the normal sort of cost-benefit analysis that says, well, why wouldn't they? There's such a high return on this thing. Get shortcutted by the fact that they don't have the, the luxury of thinking long-term and one bad season means one dead child. And there is no fooling around about this. So the fact that we may have some sort of a notion that this would be in their best interest, it's not irrationality that stands between them and taking those choices. You need to get inside their, not just their value set, but their reality to understand why some of these innovations have been successful in scaling, not so much because they maximized reward, but because they minimized or indemnified the risk of trying to take those chances, and they shortened the time frames to things that poor farmers could realistically take into account. Fifth, monopoly and monopsony, words that are usually anathema to economists, are sometimes important to get things going. It's just tough to get over the first mover problem because in this field, whereas in some areas, the people who move first capture a great advantage, it's not always true in pro poor agriculture. And sometimes the people who move first incur the costs without being able to capture the benefits. So in order to counteract that, it is sometimes necessary to give people exclusive licenses or privileged access. However, that almost always ends up presenting a challenge later. So the strong counsel on this is do it if you must, but have your eye on the exit ramp as you do it and figure out how competition is gonna re-enter the conversation as soon as it realistically can. Next to last, the devil is in the details, especially logistics. When we do projects, when we do research, our usual intention is to control as many of the variables as we possibly can. We're trying our best to reduce uncertainty, but in the real world, uncertainty and details are all over things. And if you look at the things that move successfully to scale through either markets or governments or both, you can't but be astounded by the number of moving parts and the number of people that are involved in those moving parts. So the people who succeed at this know how to manage logistics, large scale logistics. And that's why we end up with governments and markets as the principal mechanism. Because as soon as you interject someone who's really adroit at the project level, you almost always are dealing with somebody who does not have either the networks, the contacts, or sometimes the expertise to manage logistics at the scale that's necessary if you're really delivering at scale. And finally, the ability to pivot is essential for all, for all a successful scaling efforts. This is a hard one for donors in particular to digest, but if you looked at the pathways to scale of the projects that I was talking about, you would find that not a single one of those pathways was straight. The predictions at the beginning didn't turn out to be the solutions at the end. And those adjustments along the way have everything to do with what succeeds and what fails. That means if you measure things by whether they stuck to their original plan, you're almost always dooming them to failure because the original plan is gonna to have to change if they're gonna be successful at what they're doing. So it puts a premium on what some people call adaptive management and it puts a premium on funders and researchers to incorporate that into their research designs and funding models. Now, there's a lot more we could say about this, but I wanna mostly end with a conclusion and with an invitation. So the conclusion is this, a bad system will defeat a good innovation every time. So every time you're focused on an innovation, do not abstract it for the, from the system. Do not look for the way to look only at effectiveness, absent efficiency and expansion. 
do not think that if we could only prove the case, it would go to scale. Recognize it has everything to do with changing the system. And if we have an intervention, call it a project. If we have an innovation, call it a piece of research. Everything should be focused on what it needs to do in order to produce a permanent change in one of those systems or the combination of the two. Governments, markets, or the intersection between the two. For those of you who are interested in focusing more on this, there's a very, very lively set of discussions going on. I mentioned the source book that Julie and I wrote. That's available free to anyone who's interested. But there's also a, a community of practice that I chair on scaling development outcomes. It looks at education, health, agriculture, nutrition, and so on, and has working groups in each of those areas. Any of you who are interested are most welcome to join by contacting us through the, the website that's mentioned there, if there's no charge. And if you do join, please also join the working group on agriculture and rural development, which is chaired by Leonard Voltering at CIMIT. And I've given you his email in case you want to reach out directly to him. I want to end, if I could, with just a word, particularly to the, the donors and the governments who may be listening into this conversation. And that is the researchers, the project people, they take their cues from you on this. If you're focused on scale, they'll be focused on scale. If you're not, they won't. And in the world we've created, perhaps by accident, we've created a world where project, the reward for a good project is another project, or the reward for a good piece of research is another piece of research. That's not the world we need if we're gonna do this. If we're gonna do this, we need a world where the eyes are on scale from the beginning and where the system is what we're focused on. And everything we do is targeted to trying to make a permanent sustainable change in those things. That involves changes in policies, procedures, incentives on our side, on the government side, and on the side ultimately of the beneficiaries who we're all trying to serve. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Larry. I must admit that I really like this, his paper on Sourcebook on scaling agriculture innovation published by Purdue and um, was saving an interesting talk for the last. Um, the next speaker needs no introduction, but I'm going to say anyway, because I've really enjoyed the uh, past interaction with Dr. Christian Witt, who is the senior program officer in the agricultural development team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He provides strategic direction on innovation in soil health and agronomy as part of the digital farmer services portfolio aimed at increasing productivity and income of smallholder farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. He's gonna share with us data collection and mining, where I spend most of my life doing, and so I'm eager to learn from him. Over to you, Christian. My name is Christian Witt. I'm a senior program officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation overseeing our work in soil health and agronomy. I will be talking about soil agronomy data and data mining today. And we usually uh, find it uh, helpful to, when we talk about data, to put them in the context of the digital X system, which uh, could uh, here uh, make, made, be made up of three components, the enabling environment, the data and content itself, and then the tools and applications. And we primarily look at data in the context of digital pharma services here. Um, but there are other use cases, of course, uh, that, that, that uh, data are be used for. So I focus on soil diagnostics and field trial data, uh, but also satellite and drone imagery because uh, the raw data, the field data, we often use in combination with remote sensing data to generate these secondary data, also including models. Uh, so to arrive at data-driven agronomy or soil maps, um, whatever is needed to power um, uh, advisory services. Um, so we have been investing in the last uh, 10 years uh, quite a bit in um, digital soil mapping. And you see here a uh, collection of uh, data points that were derived from different organizations at different times. And um, 
there are data products that were derived from such data sets, for example, from ISRIC, the World Soil Information Center, 250 meter soil property prediction product. Uh, or here, uh, a not for profit, ISDA Africa has developed a 30 meter resolution product. And this is only possible when data are shared. Uh, and uh, it is quite an effort to retrofit data sharing agreements and bring these data uh, from the public or the private space together in such a way that they can be shared. Uh, we have therefore been working with um, CABI and the Open Data Institute uh, to get better at, uh, at the onset clarifying how data are accessed, are they, can they be made findable, uh, how are they made interoperable and also then reusable so that if one single data point is ever generated that they, it doesn't have to be uh, generated again. And so for uh, the public space, uh, the public sector investing in, in data, I think it is an overlooked area, but increasingly receiving attention. Uh, for example, we have been working in, with the government partners in Ethiopia uh, to um, develop a very progressive uh, data sharing pol policy on soil data now that clarifies, you know, uh, which data are closed, which data are open, because FAIR doesn't necessarily mean that everything is open. It just means um, that there's clarity on, you know, who has access rights. So for policy reasons or privacy reasons from the consumer, you have to have this sorted. And often soil data in the past were taken without the consent of farmers. So that is today then a challenge, of course. However, um, we look at the history of the soil data that were generated. And if you look forward, uh, what's the future? Uh, we believe that there is uh, a need to invest in data as a public good so that others can innovate on top of it. Uh, these are just base layers that are far too expensive to be uh, generated uh, by other players, like the private sector players, and then they wouldn't be necessarily fair and open. So um, if you look forward, the pivot from wet chemistry to spectroscopy, for example, and new initiatives like LOSOLA and the Global Soil Laboratory Network, uh, supported by FAO, offers opportunities to uh, create global soil libraries. So, you know, with new diagnostic tools, you can stand in the field, take a measurement, the, uh, it's pinged to the cloud, you receive a prediction back, and then you can develop on top of it, you know, your algorithms and models to service your farmers or whatever you like to do. And this generates new data as well that could be brought in to augment the more public-driven um, soil surveying that's going on and has dominated, uh, you know, for good reason up until now. But how do we arrive at more blended models? And again, it requires very clear data sharing agreements at the onset, but we expect in the next five to 10 years, quite uh, an evolution of that space and a more democratization, if you like, as well of, you know, for example, soil data generation. It's far more complex with agronomy data as we look at it. Um, it is more complicated because you're not only dealing with, you know, soils and 10, 15 parameters, you're dealing with different crops grown in cropping systems in rotation with other crops. You have a high degree of variability. And we all know that, you know, if you have two fields that are adjacent within a few seasons, especially in the tropics, you could have very uh, different uh, natural resource based building because you change soil organic matter, you change soil structure and the resource rich farmer could uh, actually improve soil much more easily than a resource poor farmer on the same soil. So who might be mining the soil or she might, uh, you know, not have livestock, for example. So how do we again deal with this tension between locally relevant and at the same time doing research at scale. It, it will always involve some sort of uh, field trials, crop modeling, spatial modeling, um, but we have not been good at uh, bringing all the pieces together. And this is why we 
support uh, the CG effort on excellence in agronomy to develop a global agronomy program to uh, really not duplicate efforts to more rapidly learn, to move towards agile research. And again, we believe that uh, such a public good is needed uh, to power uh, you know, both uh, public sector use cases, uh, but also private sector initiatives or any, anyone who's in between like uh, social enterprises, you know, engaged in providing services to farmers, for example. Um, technology doesn't seem to be the main problem. I think, how do we rapidly generate ground truthing data that can be used, but also how do we blend local knowledge with these spatial knowledge that we're generating. We found, for example, in interacting with One Acre Fund, one of our grantees, that even if they measured everything in the field that they could sort of defend, not, not to be going overboard with costs and logistics, they could not predict yield. There are too many other factors, you know, influencing yield formation. So there's a limitation as to data mining when it comes to that. But in the um, project here presented uh, under Aquilimo on cassava agronomy, we found that simple visuals of root tuber sizes of cassava helped farmers estimate their natural soil fertility. And if this local knowledge was in real time brought into the decision making process, we could improve the prediction power of our models as to you know modeling yield or nutrient requirements, et cetera. And therefore, you know, uh, really arriving at more meaningful and more impactful advisory. Uh, so we need to be creative, I believe, and uh, not get boxed into thinking, oh, we could if we could measure everything, uh, you know, we could apply machine learning to model everything. No, it'll require very different approaches to be combined and it's probably quite use case specific. So I wanna conclude uh, just by saying, we see great variation also in the, um, in the, in the country's settings. Uh, and uh, it depends on where a country is in the trajectory of agricultural uh, development. Uh, on you know what the next step might be uh, for a particular country to invest in data or the systems, and that that's something we're very keen to uh, understand better and work with our partners uh, to uh, really find then the right entry point for for uh, improving um, the situation. So thank you very much. Well. Thank you so much for the great presentation. Now comes the fun part. I would like to ask um, our esteemed speakers to join me in this virtual stage and um, look forward to their answers to the questions that have already been posted here in the Q&A window. I would encourage all of you to continue posting your questions. Let's keep it lively and let's make it really interesting about some of the hard lessons and, and, and questions that you are yearning to, to learn from them. So I would like to first ask um, David, um, thank you so much for your great presentation on apps. I really learned quite a bit and know some of the founders you mentioned. The question from the audience is, you talked about apps must be clear, concise and manageable. To what extent do farmers really know what they need? Yeah, thank you, Leslie. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, not manageable, but actually actionable. The, the farmers need to uh, be able to uh, take the output from that application and, and apply it to their lives. So it needs to be actionable, such as uh, having access to the agrochemical that's being recommended, for example. Um, farmers actually know what they need. I, I've engaged a lot of uh, with farmers over the years in participatory research starting from my early days at Cement uh, as a plant breeder and engaging farmers on what their aspirations are for their maize crop. And so understanding price is a real important uh, input for farmers. Two is weather, especially in the light of climate change and the increased weather variability uh, farmers face. And the third is specific uh, agronomic recommendations. 
um, again, that are actionable. Uh, th these three things are what farmers were really looking for, and at least the farmers I've engaged with in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Um, so, um, you know, that farmers are very um, resourceful, and they have to be. Um, they're operating in a very challenging environment. Um, and I think one of the things, to Larry's point around scaling, um, I found that lead farmers are a very powerful advocate for scaling innovation, um, especially if they have the right research partnership. A second real important aspect of scaling um, is around government engagement. Uh, and we've drawn on experiences around the world in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Uh, having champions within the government that see the potential and demonstrating or documenting the impact in their country is extremely powerful in scaling these innovations. Great points. Um, I would agree with you 100% from my interaction so far in several of the countries in emerging market. Um, next question is for Klein. Um, Hello Tractor is a well-known app and I met the founder as well um, on one of my mission. Do you see similar trends for lower cost equipment that help farmers increase product value? That's a very good question. I, I see uh, very similar trends and that was one of the things I mentioned in my talk when I said there's business models. In fact, um, Hello Tractor is one of the companies I approach in, in working with them. And if you look at some of the trends, trends in app developments in the developed um, world, it's about sharing apps, apps that share uh, your home, for for example, Airbnb, you know, share your home uh, rather than, you know, invest in, in going to a hotel, share taxi, uh, ride shares. So I think um, uh, um, you, you have opportunities for uh, apps like hello tractor in, in in other spaces and it all co comes down to how that technology is developed uh you can only have a type of share share an app if you have a technology that's amenable to for example if it's mobile if it's portable uh you can't have that type of uh sharing app if your technology itself is not designed in such a way that it, it can be mobile. Yeah, I would agree as well. Um, so I will um, turn over to Larry. Um, Larry, typically the way innovations work or don't work is that someone has an idea then tries to implement the idea. Mm -hmm. Am I correct in interpreting that you are saying is that we need to instead focus on the problem we're trying to solve rather than the solution? Yeah, there's a phrase that, that I like to use that says you should always be sure to fall in love with the problem before you embrace the solution. Because once people start scaling the solution, they keep trying to identify and overcome the obstacles to scaling that solution. It's impossible. It's just human nature. You fall in love with the things that you invent. And so unless you spend enough time really understanding the problem and focusing on that from the beginning, the chances of going wrong go up by an order of magnitude, not because people are doing things foolishly, but because they're now focused on solving another problem, which is the problem of how to scale the thing they've already decided to, to scale. That's issue number one. Issue number two on that for me is that, as I mentioned briefly, technology is essential, but it's not the, typically the binding constraint. If you look back at why the things that scaled scaled, and why the things that didn't, didn't. Very rarely is it that the very best idea scaled and the, all the other ones failed. It was that people really attended to all those factors. Some of them, I, I've grouped a class of things that I call intermediation, which is a kind of an abstract way to think about it, but it's all that stuff related to aggregation, to marketing, to financing, to risk reduction, to promotion, all that stuff that frequently involves, especially with the apps, network effects, where it works better when there's more when there are more people involved in doing it. Those things require a kind of an entrepreneurial zeal in making things happen and a lot of course changes along the way. So if people get too preoccupied, even those of us who are on the research side, if we get too preoccupied with trying to maximize the efficacy of the technical innovation, we're gonna walk past a lot of those other issues. And by the time we try to find our way back, 
we will have missed a couple of very important forks in the road. Very good point. Um, I'm a technologist myself, and I had to constantly remind myself that we're not obsessed by the, the solution, the technology alone, because we don't want a technology looking for a problem to solve. So fully agree with you, 100%. Um, so next up is a question for uh, Christian. The audience wanted to know from you about the, uh, you talk about the data that can be considered as a public good. Uh, it's an interesting one. How do we finance it coming from a funder's point of view? Well, if we look at opportunities, we look at um, what is the real bottleneck um, so uh, to innovation. I, I give you an example from a finance perspective. If you look at inclusive finance and um, you know the ability for a financial platform to scale, that is quite limited unless there's interoperability between uh, different systems. So, we asked ourselves, you know, you could continue investing in platform by platform by platform, but there's a, a limit to market growth. So what, what innovation is really driving or holding us back uh, here that's needed to, uh, for all of us to innovate, for, for all the different actors in, uh, in the ecosystem? Uh, so, for example, on, on soil data, it's simply too expensive and too complicated and complex to be handled by the private sector, but if we are stuck in our 1980s thinking on you know, how to generate, manage soil data, there's no economy of scale, it's extremely costly, and that's why there has been limited investments in the last 20 years. However, there are, there's technology that uh, can be brought to bear that allows us to reduce cost, increase accuracy, scalable technologies, and and so you you'll see innovation making a great difference and that's the kind of catalytic catalytic investments that uh you know we're looking at or we're looking for great point um i think we're going to stay with you for a little longer because there's a question from the audience and it seems like a lot of services and, and emerging tools and services that you talked about are mostly being used by the likes of the ngos with the farmers they work with using donor funds to cover costs. What's the vision for scaling these approaches outside and beyond NGO funding partners? Are we talking about bundled or pay services? What's the success so far? Good question. Yeah, I saw the question of Janice, uh, uh, right on target. I mainly focused on really the soil health and agronomy data issue here, but yes, evidence suggests really to make things work at the farm end it will require, at least for the foreseeable future, some model around bundled services, because otherwise, not all the pieces add up. So if you look at, for example, uh, One Acre Fund, which I would not consider a typical NGO that relies on uh, you know, donor funding, uh, uh, they are at 75% relying on uh, base uh, um, formed around the cost model. So their, their, their uh, coverage is 75% from the revenue that they generate with farmers paying for the service. Uh, but 25% is needed to drive their R&D pipeline, which in my view, you know, is, is uh, in part because um, the R&D systems have failed to generate the public goods that organizations like One Acre needs to further localize, you know, um, let's say um, the agronomic advisory. So uh, bringing together, you know, in insurance, risk management, um, bringing together uh, finance, bringing together advisory, bring, bringing together inputs and connecting to markets is extremely challenging in these environments where you're dealing with uh, many, many farmers, millions of farmers, but also great diversity within the farming community. So, for example, there's a great deal to learn actually from One Acre. The the um, the solutions that they offer is not a, is not something uh, necessarily a good fit for every farmer in the regions where they operate. But uh, uh, so um, I think we see increasingly a variety of service providers. Uh, chipping away at at this, and um, I would expect in the next five to ten years, um, much more you know provision of of uh, 
bundled services as we figure out the individual pieces and how to integrate them. And I think what Larry said in his presentation, starting at the back end to see where where is it not working at the back end and then working backwards to innovate backwards basically is is so important, yeah. Very good points. Uh, I personally learned quite a lot from that myself and have to continuously iterate on the back end piece and find the bottlenecks. Um, I also want to turn it to other panelists if they would like to chime in on the comments on this question, because this is a really great question from the audience. Does anyone want to, to add to what Christian said? Uh, it's Larry, I'll just say a word I, by way of addition. I completely agree with that response. Uh, and I think sometimes you see exactly the opposite take place successfully also. Uh, the usual model of success does involve some bundling of things, but I've seen some very interesting cases where things got unbundled. In other words, where things were put together and demonstrated and taken to a certain level when you could control the integration. And then at some point, the market saw some pieces of it that they found more useful and more effective than others. And they took those pieces and they integrated those pieces, it would no longer be recognizable to the originator as their innovation or their package, but it nevertheless would have made an important contribution to the overall outcome. And I think at some point it's important to think about the branding and not always, but sometimes to subordinate the ego that goes with being the first mover in this, that somehow having your, your innovation or your package cannibalized is not necessarily a bad thing is sometimes exactly the route to scale. I would say that's in some portion of cases more typically, it's what Christian said, I believe, which is that if you leave it to that piece by piece sort of solution, you wind up with some important piece missing. And therefore someone doing that kind of uh, mapping and aggregation, in my, my opinion, usually in the middle of a value chain becomes extremely important. Great point, thank you. I, like I, have a, I have an observation talk. around anthropology, Leslie. Uh, I, I've you know heard a lot about technology, but I haven't really heard much about anthropology. I, I think that you know for scaling, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the term of boundary partners, but understanding the role and contribution of different actors within the scaling ecosystem is very important. And uh, as Larry said, setting aside some ego so that there's space in, for everyone to contribute towards uh, scaling a solution be it a lead farmer, all the way through to a senior public official. Um, and science needs to fit within that ecosystem. So I think that's something that we really need to take on board and uh, just want to highlight that. Uh, Great point. I like ingredient that. for success. Good, good. And actually, um, so let, there's a question from the audience about apps. Um, do fa African farmers really need apps or simple apps of proven concept? Anyone wants to take that? Simple is good. <laughs> Anyone uh, else? Yeah, yeah, this is Klein here. I, the, the way I look at an app is it provides a uh, benefit uh, to certain applications. For, for example, one of the benefits, the types of app I will advocate for my own product will be an app that will enable people to be able to purchase request, purchase the product, provide extension services of how to use utilize the product easily without actually having to put boots on the ground. So that's a very low cost means for a startup to get extension services and logistics in place uh, without actually, you know, throwing a lot of extension workers out on the, on, on the ground. And I think it's very valuable. Anyone wants to add to that? Okay. Well, um, Larry, seems like you want yeah. to speak. Well, I'm not sure it's really an addition, but one of the things, I'm not a, nearly as much an agricultural expert as any of the other panelists, but one of the things that I have had the benefit of is running this community of practice on scaling that looks across sectors. And there's a, a to me, a really interesting comparison between agriculture and health. Uh, and health has learned to do a lot of things remotely. I mean, a lot. Education, I would say for better or for worse, 
is being forced to learn some things because of what's happened with COVID recently, but it's been pretty re resistant to that traditionally. It's interesting to, to me to watch where the limits and the boundaries are for agriculture, because we've so often thought that extension is a person to person process. And I think we're learning that to some extent that's true and maybe in some areas it's not true. And one of the, the things I often say when I'm talking about scaling is having looked across sectors for reasons I only partially understand the average amount of time it takes in innovation to go to scale, if it goes to scale, is about 15 years. But it's also the case that with these technology-driven things, it may be changing that timeline. It hasn't been around long enough to be able to answer that question. But when you look at how some of these things scale and the, the network effects and the way the pathways operate, I think it's at least possible that the way scaling happens and the way things go from incremental to exponential can be quite different with these things. And so I'm personally, I would say optimistic, even while I remain a little bit skeptical about some of the overhype that goes with it sometimes. I, I would also agree with you because I come from several different sector, uh, financial fintech sector, and now I see fintech and ag tech coming together in the convergence. And I also spent about 10 years in life sciences. So I see a lot of the deep tech in ag tech as well. So learning from the other sector is definitely critical and how COVID actually accelerated the whole adoption of digital technology. Um, the, the next question is actually for Christian on soy carbon is increasingly important as we attempt to mitigate climate change. Very important topic. I just read the book from uh, Bill Gates on how to avoid the climate disaster, right? So is there a data system evolving to help inform stakeholders? Christian, do you have a comment on that? Yes, I'm thinking it is a tough one <clears throat> because um, you know, the, the monitoring, validation, evaluation of soil carbon stocks is, um, it's, an, it's, an, it's a very difficult, um, uh, you know, from a technology standpoint, but also if we look at, um, you know, increasing soil carbon as a, as a goal for carbon sequestration uh, comes with a cost, because if you wanted to increase you know, soil carbon, that, that's not necessarily the primary interest of a farmer. The, the primary interest of a farmer is turnover. What you want is you want to have enough standing biomass in the field that you can incorporate so that you can, you know, drive the microbial engine in the soil that, you know, provides, uh, you know, with soil health, great physical and, uh, and, and the biological and, and soil chemical structures. So the, the concept in itself, um, you know, we shouldn't just look at the technology. Well, how do we measure it? And so can we put it to, into finance models? We need to look at very carefully where are actually you know, agricultural areas where you could increase, uh, you know, soil organic matter or soil carbon sustainably. And, um, and, and can it be sustained at that level? And then what is the cost? So you, for, for example, to produce more biomass, which you need to do if you wanted to drive up soil carbon, you need nitrogen. How does the nitrogen cycle then affect, you know, your overall greenhouse gas balance? So it, it's, it, the proof is in the pudding, as my good friend, you know, Andy McDonald would say on this. But um, I think, you know, on the technology side, it's probably the easiest piece because uh, we have um, uh, increasingly, uh, uh, you know, methods, spectroscopy methods. There's, there's other very fascinating technology under development to rapidly assess soil carbon. I think within a few years, you, you should be able to do this in the field with, with very low cost technology, ping your data to the cloud, you know, then uh, so that that's not an issue. Uh, I, I think the issue is elsewhere. Yeah. All right. Well, we have a very limited amount of time left. So I'm going to ask this one question that came in from the audience. Um, um, agriculture is running by the farmers, uh, by their own interests. However, the benefits are engulfing by the middlemen and companies. How can we minimize the exploitations by improving farmers led village based market systems? Anyone wants to take this question? 
Well, applications, I think, can compress value chains. And as I mentioned, uh, push the value to the farmer in the form of increased profits through accessing premium markets and to the consumer and having knowledge of where their food came from and assurance if they have trust with that farmer that it's been produced safely. So apps do serve that world, but uh, it's not simple to execute at scale. Good point. Anyone else? I would say that the, <clears throat> there's a special case in kind of embedded in that question about values in this, that clearly what gets a lot of us into this is trying to make sure there's real value to people who are otherwise excluded or marginalized. Uh, personally, I don't think that's possible without also yielding value to the people in the middle. Uh, these are people who are not poor. In fact, in some cases they're wealthy, often they're somewhere in the middle of that, but it's awkward for people who are funding things publicly to do things that are directly supportive of people who are not themselves in need. And so I think we need to think our way all the way through what we're willing to do, what we're not willing to do in service of the ultimate objectives that we have. And it's not, a at that point, it's not a technical question as much as it is a values question. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, all of you, for a great, robust uh, exchange and very lively interaction. Great questions from the audience. Um, I cannot believe how time flies so quickly. Um, I, we could continue on for the next few hours, uh, and I would love to continue this conversation in future because I think there is so much value from this, um, this sort of exchange. And personally, I learned a lot from this. Through this diverse panel of agriculture experts, we explore so many of these issues or, and, and opportunities around digital agriculture uh, solutions and also understanding the problem space at a deeper level. I have my key takeaways, and I think this is where the innovators can come in and showcase through apps, through various technology. But we also need to understand the problem space very well, especially in the emerging market for where development agenda comes into play and how do we really drive scale sustainably through the long term, not just the short term viewpoints and how what are the, the perspective from the funders point of view and how do we really look at this from ecosystem to drive scale in the long run that can benefit all and what is the, the role of public sector leaders who can come in to strengthen the institutional role of government in fostering the thriving ACTAC ecosystem in different parts of the world i've seen that in um, kenya and now going into indonesia so i'm extremely grateful to the organizing team at purdue university especially for, to professor chifley and professor hurst for convening this group of experts and like-minded professionals to exchange their learnings Above all, thank you all to the audience for your great participation and the questions. We don't even have time to cover all of them, but stay tuned to the next session coming up soon uh, at the Global Agriculture Innovation Forum, session five. Um, here it is on the farms and farmers will be informed and connected to markets on March 30th at 9 a.m. Eastern time. So until next time, stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you so much for all their great interaction and learning.